Okay. Domestic threats associated with irregular warfare. Uh, thank you very much. I would almost be tempted to reverse the question, not in order to avoid it, uh, but I would argue that certainly my generation of, uh, of operators, both from a Navy and from a maritime perspective, have spent uh, a huge amount of time in recent uh, decades in the dust of Afghanistan and the deserts of Iraq on uh, countering uh, irregular warfare, high coin, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and we're almost in danger of having forgotten what our primary purpose is, which is the uh, sort of major combat operations. Uh, reminded that uh, a significant element of the, I would also remind you that a significant element of the Royal Navy uh, continues uh, to be focused on uh, littoral operations. Our three largest capital ships uh, in the Royal Navy, our Bay class uh, ships from the uh, Royal Fleet Auxiliary are, are both dedicated to littoral operations, uh, both of which uh, have been at the forefront of uh, countering regular warfare, certainly the high coin, um, uh, high intensity counterinsurgency uh, fight uh, for the last uh, 15 to 20 years, not forgetting um, 350 years of excellence from the Royal Marines. Uh, most of their fights have actually been in uh, what we would uh, argue as being counterinsurgency or, or countering ir irregular warfare. Um, it's, and certainly whether you look at it from a blue water a starting point or whether you look at it from a brown water starting point, um, the countering, uh, countering irregular warfare, high intensity counter, uh, counterinsurgency 
is an absolute central part of our, our mission set. Uh, and we do that whether from, uh, whether from a blue water starting point or whether from a brown water starting point. Um, recognizing that most of those fights take place ashore. They take place in the land environment. Um, force on mind, uh, dealing with the uh, wills and aspirations uh, of the local population uh, and the struggle for their support or at least their uh, uh, antipathy uh, in, in that land uh, environment. So it's very much um, for us uh, a battle that's uh, a battle for, this, for a state of mind. And as, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have considerable experience of that uh, in recent years, uh, reforged uh, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. In terms of our, our capability changes, um, uh, you've heard in a previous panel uh, talk about uh, the modifications to our, most of our capital ships in order to make them more capable uh, in a global environment. They weren't, uh, most of them weren't acquired for, the, uh, for environments like the Gulf uh, in terms of salinity and heat. Uh, and we are now taking, making some modifications in those areas. And certainly, as part of my bailiwick, we're looking uh, to the recapitalization of our amphibious fleets uh, in order to try and make them truly global ships. Thank you, Brigadier. My next question is for uh, Stephen. Given the changes in the strategic environment, how is the Marine Corps adapting to meet those challenges? I think if you look at uh, what we're looking at right now in terms of joint co concepts, uh, I think you really have to consider uh, what the future is going to be in ensuring access to the global commons. And I think the Marine Corps as a maritime force in concert with the Navy is, uh, is well prepared to, to meet those challenges, although understanding that when you talk about the access to the global commons, that area of 200 nautical miles or so within the littoral regions where you have a lot of population, economic activity, and in some cases some of the threats you discussed in terms of piracy, um, maritime issues as well. Uh, the ability of the Navy and the Marine Corps working together uh, to ensure access to the global commons, which I'll define as the land, sea, air, as well as the cyber realm uh, and space, uh, is going to be critical to the economic viability uh, of the globe. And so this is going to be a, a threat that we're going to have to continue to ensure that we gain or maintain access to the global commons uh, and that we maintain freedom of action and dominance uh, so that we can ensure really global security as well as economic security to a large degree. But I think that's going to be, that is the threat right there is ensuring that we maintain, that all countries maintain access to these critical areas. That's great insights. Thank you. Uh, Bob, next question for you. Uh, based upon your time on active duty, do you believe there's a proper balance in investment in irregular warfare systems and training uh, in traditional maritime missions? Um, and should there be more investment in capabilities to combat irregular warfare challenges? Well, first, I gotta go back. I think Rich got it exactly right. If you look at irregular warfare, and there's a great debate on what really defines irregular warfare, you hear the word hybrid, you hear other terms like that, but if you look at what we've done in the last 15 years, uh, that defines irregular warfare. And don't look at it from just a U.S. perspective and coalition perspective in Iraq and Afghanistan, but look at what's going on in Lebanon with the Lebanese army, what they dealt with in Northern Ireland. I said, predominantly, you don't deal with a state actor. These are non-state actors. And in the last 14 years, even in Iraq, after two weeks, there was no state entity to deal with. And if you, you look at the Navy's role in the last 14 years, it's been critical, but not at sea. The capabilities that the Navy and Marine Corps team have brought to the fight in support have been game-changing. CBs who built infrastructure that moved around the battlefield, the ability to project power from the sea when there wasn't a safe haven or access. Those sort of traits are going to be critical going forward, but the Navy understanding how they leverage those capabilities 
you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, anywhere in the world where it's going to be called upon is necessary. And I say now we're even seeing a new phase of this phenomenon, irregular warfare, because none of these actors we, we dealt with posed existential threats, and you could deal with them as kind of a tactical entities, be it the Taliban, even Al-Qaeda and Taliban. But now what we're seeing in the ISIS threat is a scale and scope of capabilities where they weren't even leveraging state entities, but could function as a military force because their size and capacity, similar to a state entity, of owning large swaths of land, being able to seize cities and take any, in an organization that's very decentralized, organized, and equipped. So the Navy is very well positioned to be able to bring power and force from the tactical level, be it a Marine, MEF, a recon team, uh, a, a SEAL platoon, any of those, anywhere in the world quickly to address some of those problems, much less the other skills they have, sharing intelligence, uh, armed ISR, all of that stuff anywhere in the world at any time. And I don't know if the Navy really realizes the, the potential they have to command and control that. In the last 14 years, they've been a supporting entity when they really have the ability to be the command and control function in doing that. So when I look at the capabilities, there's two things I would think the Navy, a realization of that, the tactics, techniques, procedures, and doctrine that allowed them to do that. But more importantly, as Rich said, taking the corporate knowledge of those individuals who have been doing this for 14 years and injecting that into Navy policy and strategy. I'm struck because I know SEAL teams, I know ships, I've met commanders recently 15 years in. I have one kid, he was a, uh, he went through BUDS, our training program in 2000 after getting out of the Naval Academy. Became a young ensign in the SEAL platoon, 2001. We dropped him in the desert in the middle of Afghanistan in the first week of October to recce to lead recce for the Marines before Jim Madison came. That kid is now the commanding officer of a SEAL team. 15 years and all he knows is war up to this point. And the same in the Marines. And the, those are going to be the leaders who have that corporate knowledge and understanding of what irregular warfare in this fight is and can influence the policy uh, and strategy of the Navy to do that and, and, and hence draw uh, the capabilities and projection. I'd add one last point. I think it's also important to note, I don't see, uh, and Rich's point, yes, we have forgot about the larger war, but I can't see one of those on the horizon. And I think our ability to reconstitute when we see that is, is strong. Uh, and yet, I don't think we've made that paradigm. Secretary of Defense Gates, as he walked out the door, said, hey, we're no longer going to build armies to be occupying forces. And you're going to see the size of the army shrink. There lies the opportunity for the naval Navy forces to realize that and really build and structure and leverage the large wealth and experience they have to shape it going forward. Thank you. Um, you know, based upon uh, my personal experiences, three tours in Afghanistan as a naval intelligence officer, I agree wholeheartedly with your comments. And based on your comments, I'm going to pose this question to all three of you, and we'll start with Brigadier. The majority of today's maritime threats emanate uh, from civil society or focus on, and they focus on illicit activities from terrorist groups and organizations. And they're oftentimes supported directly or indirectly by local communities. As uh, you know, Admiral Miller said earlier, 90% of the population lives in the little twirls. So that's where they receive their support. Do you believe there's a need for greater investment in intelligence capabilities that focus on uh, counterinsurgency in the little twirls or your activities in the little twirls uh, to counter these uh, activities? That's a very interesting question for the Royal Navy. Why? Uh, in the Second World War, the Royal Navy's intelligence capability was certainly from a UK perspective, I would argue perhaps from a global perspective, uh, second to none. Based on 150 years of persistent global presence uh, and very high levels of both knowledge and understanding based on 150 years of presence. 
And yet, in the second decade of the 21st century, the Royal, the Royal Navy doesn't have uh, a, a, a career specialization in N2 uh, intelligence. It's a subspecialization of the, of the warfare branch. Uh, however, it is absolutely recognized that um, information and intelligence are a huge force multiplier. Uh, and there's a tend but we do have a, still have a tendency to apply uh, what I would call uh, conventional intelligence and I-star capabilities uh, to the irregular warfare, high-intensity uh, high counterinsurgency in, fight in a conventional manner. What do I mean by that? What we're trying to do is do conventional targeting uh, for hard and soft effect against irregular uh, and uh, insurgent forces. What I would argue, um, based on um, uh, 15 years in, uh, you know, I first went into Afghanistan in 2001, um, three tours there, three tours in Iraq. Uh, what we lack, not just within the naval community, uh, but recognizing this is focused on the naval community, is the training and specialist skills uh, to support uh, irregular warfare operations. Uh, we lack the linguistic skills. So when I went into uh, Afghanistan in 2001, we didn't have any Pashto or Urdu speakers. At that point, we were still, the, the primary language was Serbo-Croat. Uh, and before that, the primary language was Russian. Uh, and I suspect for the next 10 years, our primary language will continue to be Pashto and Urdu, uh, and we will forget about, uh, we won't think about tomorrow's fights. What are the languages that we need to learn uh, for tomorrow? But it's not just about language. Uh, we talked earlier on about cultures. Um, I remember my, uh, my commander when I went, uh, went to Afghanistan the first time. He, when he went home, his daughter asked him, uh, Daddy, Daddy, what did you do in Afghanistan? And he said, I drank tea. He said he spent so much, in order to gain the cultural awareness, he just spent most of his time drinking tea with the local um, uh, government officials, with the national government officials, and with the local population to get that cultural awareness uh, and understanding. Um, and then being able to translate that understanding into some form of product that you can put into an information system or an intelligence system, which then informs decision making. Um, we, one of the challenges we've got, that Rich, thoughts of Richard Spencer, is our ability to keep up with the social media race. One of the things that I think defines uh, 21st century irregular warfare is the, the fact that it's moved almost from the physical, and a lot of it has moved from the physical domain into the cognitive domain uh, and into the cyber domain. Um, doing that from the sea uh, is a real challenge. What we've managed to do within the Royal Marines is we've uh, developed, uh, we've created uh, an information exploitation commando. Uh, this is a group of about 600 people who take all aspects of information surveillance, target acquisition, and reconnaissance, and mold them into an information exploitation organization. We would argue that that, that, that is currently at the forefront of uh, certainly the UK's uh, uh, information exploitation capability, um, uh, and it needs to be taken, uh, taken forward. The battle for the narrative has almost become, in irregular warfare, the center of gra gravity. Uh, and it then comes back to the sort of force on mind uh, aspects of it. The, another lesson from Afghanistan uh, uh, and Iraq has the, been the uh, decentralization of uh, intelligence collection, intelligence ana analysis based down at FOB level, at forward operating base level. Whereas in the maritime domain, and indeed I would argue in the big army domain, there is still a uh, a tendency, a predilection to sort of centralize uh, intelligence collection and intelligence analysis. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Willan, can you expand upon uh, what Brigadier Spencer uh, um, articulated from a Marine Corps perspective, please? Absolutely. Um, I think the Marine Corps has recognized uh, for a long time the, valuable, the value of intelligence, but what we've done recently, I think, to look at this in the future is one is aligning headquarters regionally to understand the cultural and societal issues that go on in these various areas. Uh, we actually have adjusted our PME now um, for our young officers where they are now assigned specific geographic areas and in some cases languages. So we can try to 
dispersed throughout the Marine Corps, a large uh, swath of language capability, which takes years to develop. And unfortunately, sometimes you will have someone get to a certain proficiency level, you pull them out of that environment where they could maintain it, and then they, uh, they go somewhere else. But I think in the long term, there are other ways as well. Um, I think in terms of what the Marine Corps brings to the table, uh, in terms of being able to go and support global combatant commanders or, or geographic combatant commanders, theater security cooperation is, is, is a big part of the intelligence process. Uh, we go in, we, we build partnership capacity with, with uh, partner nations, we work with people, uh, we learn about the culture by being there. We are a, a globally uh, deployed force. Uh, both at sea and, and most recently with our special purpose MAGTAFs, which are there specifically to develop uh, theater security partnerships or theater security cooperation partnerships. And from that, we learn about uh, the local culture, we learn about the local militaries, we get inroads into what's going on within the societies. And so I think that is part of the, the long road in terms of how we're going to get this intelligence and how the force is going to really be able to apply it later on. And I'll give you an example um, just from my time in, in Iraq as an advisor to the 7th Iraqi Army Division and, and to dovetail on the Brigadier because some of this is about relationships. And uh, I would go into the commanding general of 7th IA every morning and it would start with, a, just as he said, a cup of tea, some chai. And the other thing is I never let off with a question or uh, anything in terms of what I was looking for or what we needed to do. It started off with how his family was doing. It started off with what was he seeing, what were his perspectives. And sitting back and just taking the time to listen to what his analysis was of the situation. And then I'll move on a little bit because one day uh, we had one of the members of the division, Iraqi division, come in and said, two guys just walked into a mosque and said, who in here is Al-Qaeda? And then they shot him. And that became a turning point for us in Iraq in, uh, in the summer of 2000, summer and fall of 2006. We later on had a, a, a gentleman from the Iraqi division who would go into town. And when he would come back, we would sit down. I would bring in then Colonel McFarland of 1-1 AD. And we would go through what was going on inside the town of Ramadi. And we would know where the IDs were being built. We would know where we were having negative implications on the po local populace because we had a tank or machine gun pointing down the wrong road and kids couldn't go to school. So by what we thought were the right actions, we were alienating certain populations, certain specific part of the population. We were able to adjust those things, allow freedom of movement for the local population, but also give us freedom of movement inside the city of Ramadi, or inside the city of Ramadi to attack these targets and it was done very effectively. So I think the Marine Corps in the long term recognizes We've got to be culturally and socially adept in the countries that we go and work in. We've got to continue to bid on these relationships. And we've got to foster this through our, our military programs and our education programs, really from the sergeant uh, through our officers. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Bob, I have a question for you. Um, Before you do, I just want to add one comment. To go ahead. They, but I think, spot on, I think they're moving. There's one other word that's important that we've learned, and it, it's back to uh, Brigadier's discussion about this decentralized intelligence collection process and no longer centralized. The one thing that has changed in that, and I still don't know if we've embraced it and adapted it enough, at the operational level, you see it some places you don't, is fusion. The, the decentralized, we've all watched this decentralized intelligence process work very well from human collection, tactical collection, all the various means, but now, and because technology has helped us just a plethora of intelligence, more than you can do, so centralized defeats the purpose. But you do need a mechanization to fuse it and then screen it so you, it can be effective. And I think we've turned that corner at the strategic level, and there's some issues with that privacy laws and that. But at the operational level, it's still a work in process. So I think it's exactly right. We can no longer go on to you know, the, the hierarchical 
uh, centralized fashion, but how we do that fusion and sifting to really get those critical nuggets you need out of the human interaction, the technical interaction, is still being defined and worked and is the holy grail for operational forces that we're still doing that. And if you don't remember, 9-11, the Intel Reform and Terrorist Prevention Act raised that as our, the U.S.'s significant problem, that we hadn't fused intelligence from the FBI, all that. We're still looking at it in the joint environment how that, but even the battlefield is this interagency where those other government agencies are pumping in information that the battlefield to commanders need. So refining and how we do that fusion to get out back that critical, the CCIRs is, I'd say what we really still got to be chasing, that holy grail that helps us, because you can be overwhelmed, not just by email, but intel and all. And so I think that's the last hurdle we need to get at, especially in this irregular warfare where the media is staying ahead of us, and we need that to be ahead of the media's just as well. So I just wanted to add that, but I think great points. I would agree with you that that was probably the most difficult challenge or hurdle that the military faces because the culture won't allow for uh, new ideas, so which will lead right to my new uh, to my question, which is, I believe that private industry is ahead of the military in certain aspects, uh, big data theory, complex theories, other uh, other aspects. So now you're in private industry. Uh, does you know? You realize that uh, private industry has uh, improved uh, community engagement strategies, increased profits long term are based upon that. All of the things that make private industry uh, profitable, do you see how that can transition from private industry to the military? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll use my example because uh, uh, it's been a journey of discovery, so to speak. I always worked with industry when I was in uniform, and now I am industry, so to speak. And like our company, a huge company, 120,000 people, 85,000 scientists who do the old PFM, pure something magic, uh, things you can't even conceive of. But why now at that point, this interaction, this partnership between industry and the, the military is more important than ever before. And I see why individuals like I fall in that realm because they can do anything if they can get that operational understanding of what the priorities are and how it's driven by a concept of understanding. And sometimes that can be the biggest disconnect between industry and the military. You can, they can solve any problem if they understand the problem and it fits into the right concept of operations that can be applied in the battle space. And I think that's the real, why these, these conferences are so important to be interact with our partners, to understand their concept in, of operations and how this technology supports that uh, uh, across the, the spectrum. And, and because they can solve it, but sometimes those scientists will take you places you don't want to go. And that's why I, I threw the hard question out to Admiral Miller on that laser. Great idea, but what's the concept? And is it a science project at this point, or is it a real operational capability? So when they've tested and vetted it, how are we going to employ it? And it, as military officers know, that application on the battlefield where that soldier or sailor is involved can take you in a whole other place you never thought possible, and you'll go there. So I think that marriage is so important, uh, especially as the technology is racing ahead at such a great speed. And thank you. Um, I think we've uh, maxed capacity on our time for the panel discussion. I want to thank all of you gentlemen of great insights. Uh, I learned a lot personally also on this. And uh, sorry we don't have time for questions, but thank you very much for your time, participation, and, uh, and your insights.